Privacy is good, right? Privacy is very important. So <clears throat> let me let me look at that and um, in turn, and I will deal with privacy online because that's sort of my realm. However, I want to look at privacy in a kind of solid essay way, you know, deconstruct it and then put it back together and despair. <laughs> um, so, why is privacy good? I mean, this whole thing about online sharing is supposed to be good for humans. Uh, we are social animals, so well, why would we, why privacy is that contrary to that? Uh, online sharing is the whole thing du jour, you know, we want, um, we, we learned that if we share, we get benefits like synchronicity, contact and human connection, we get ambient intimacy, another uh, term from my industry. Uh, ambient intimacy means that you are aware of what your friends are doing just by the virtue of following their activity streams. So that, that has benefits, apparently. There is the sort of what I call speculative sharing or broadcast where you share things about yourself uh, in the hope that someone uh, interested might pick it, so more pull. So I, I tweeted, tweeted that I'm on the bus to Oxford and a friend of mine responded, oh yes, if you, if you get off Hillingdon and walk 15 minutes you're away from my home. I'm not aware, how, I'm not quite sure how useful that is, but that's an example <laughs> of that sort of connectivity that um, could be very useful in other contexts, business or, or social or emergency or anything like that. I mean, um, synchronicity, I'm a big fan of synchronicity because it allows you to manage uh, much larger networks of people. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with Dunbar number, which is uh, actually it's an Oxford professor of anthropology or some such, uh, who claimed that um, our brains are able to meaningfully connect with about 150 people. Beyond that number, it becomes impossible to hold them all in the brain. Now, you know, average, I don't know about average Facebook um, uh, user, but I definitely have more contacts than 150. But my argument with the technology changes the definition of a relationship and a connection, makes it lighter or deeper as we need to. But synchronicity is a big deal, a uh, big part of that. So when I'm in New York and I'm walking down the street and I have a free afternoon before meeting, I can Twitter about that and someone who is nearby can say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm around, let's have coffee. And that can turn into a very useful and interesting thing. Anyway, enough about synchronicity. But all this gives us a ability to connect with people beyond usual physical social boundaries. So that's good. So I'm giving away my privacy about my location. I'm saying where I am and what I'm doing, you know, more or less. And, um, I get benefit from that. Um, a lot of this is based on the ability to publish, which is one of the most powerful functionalities to date. I mean, printing press started, you know, Renaissance, Reformation, and all that stuff. No, actually, it didn't start Renaissance. It started Reformation, at least. Um, <clears throat> and now the web enabled uh, ordinary people to publish without any permission. That is the fundamental change or shift uh, that the internet and the web has brought about in my view, just for the record. As part of the introduction still, I believe the current online web architecture is heading to a disaster, where privacy has become a binary choice, often regarded as more or less acceptable trade-off that consumers are only too willing to, to make in return for some benefits. Uh, I tend to think of it as an issue, as an issue of choice. If there is no meaningful choice and people understand this, they might just as well forgo a bit of privacy in exchange for what appears a tangible benefit, a discount, better deal. But if tools were to arise that help people to take charge of their data and uh, connections and everything in their online existence, then I believe the mindset will shift too. Now, I believe that it may not be the case, but even those people who are saying that privacy is dead have no better argument than I do. We don't know. As long as the privacy choice is binary, we don't really know what people's attitude to privacy is. Because if you can't play, if your only option to protect your privacy is not to play, that is not a meaningful choice. Um, some people disagree, but that's my position. 
<clears throat> so on the most basic and practical level, online privacy uh, is about creating tools that help the individual to control access to data to the point where she or she decides practically and directly who gets to see that. What I mean by practically, sorry, by directly means without reliance upon a third party or intermediary. This is very important to me and I'll explain why later on. But let's, let's first look at why privacy is good and necessary, or good or necessary. As Mr. Zuckerberg argues when defending Facebook's latest encroachment of users' privacy, the social norms are changing, people are sharing openly, interestingly they're sharing more than they'd admit to if asked beforehand, that's part of Facebook's argument. And um, what he claims is that Facebook is merely following the social norm. Well, apart from the utter unwholesomeness of this defense, because, well, let's say, most people are interested in bread and games, so let's make that, that the norm. And yes, I'm aware that I just compared Facebook users to mob. Um, it undermines any choice in the matter. Facebook likes to describe itself as a social utility, which is a dangerous comparison. It is claiming the place of an infrastructure in an environment where infrastructure is based on autonomy and peerage. That environment is called the internet. So, I'll go back to that, I'll come back to that. I got carried away there, but I, I, I yeah, let's talk Mrs. Zuckerberg for Jeremy Bentham. Another architect, or an environment where privacy was used for social engineering experiment. Panopticon? Yeah, I'm sure people are aware, otherwise it wouldn't be here, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so again. Panopticon. Right. It's alright. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Panopticon was, yes, yeah, dangerous because most of you know, <laughs> so I have to get it right, rest of the kid began to. Panopticon was uh, designed for a prison that uh, architected the prison in a way that the guard tower was in the middle, in the center, right. and the guard could see the cells and whatever the prisoner was doing. Right. Now, what was supposedly clever about it, or actually is clever about it, is that the prisoners did not know that the guard, when the guard was watching them or not. They had to assume that he was watching them at all times. Right. And that was meant to reform them. That was meant to change the way they behaved and how they um, watched their own behavior that was supposedly criminal by default and by being watched they stopped being criminal. Uh, I'm probably not doing great justice to it, but that's the gist of it. So Panopticon was designed to change behavior, uh, though this was seen as a feature, not a bug. This was the whole point of that, as social reform of prisoners. And in, I mean, this is a supposition, but I think that in Bentham's time, Bentham's time, privacy was inherent in human dignity and identity. Uh, it wasn't even defined as a right. Now. I'm aware this was for a certain class of people, this wasn't for um, everyone because I can imagine privacy was non-existent if you lived in a community, a small, small village or something. One of the things that I notice when I go back to that kind of environment, that privacy just doesn't even occur to anyone. You, you, you're part of the whole fabric of the society and that's it. Um, but anyway, for some people, uh, and I would argue that for the father, the, the founding fathers, the authors of the U.S. Constitution, privacy wasn't even defined as a right because it was such a big part of who they were and how, how you behaved. But that's a, that's another debate. Um, I think at that time it was uh, you watched convicted criminals, not free citizens. You ruled your own home. It was intrinsic to the concept of liberty. That's my that's how I believe they thought from their writings. Then we have, so we have Panopticon, then we have something uh, closer to this age, Big Brother, uh, where lack of privacy on the political level amounts to greater control of individuals by the state, which makes us as individuals open to abuses of power. And uh, that, in its most primitive form, comes from um, the information is power dictum, so if you know more about the other person they know about you, you, you arguably have more power and can abuse it. <coughs> there are many other aspects of it, but let's stick with the simple one. During communism, privacy was non-existent or seen as undesirable. Anyone was allowed and encouraged to report on you. Sometimes they wanted you to know that, sometimes not. 
uh, often not, especially once they realize people will look for new ways of communicating and gathering. Uh, I remember recognizing a certain click or tone on the phone which meant it was tapped. Uh, we had various coded ways of communicating to confuse them, but ultimately lack of privacy and constant surveillance made the dissident movement pretty ineffectual. It works. If you survey uh, everything, you get people stop behaving in ways that they don't want to. Yes, there is always the channeling into other areas and um, other ways. And as far as communication was concerned, that worked, but in anything more than communication became pretty ineffectual. That's a fact. <clears throat> On the social level, loss of privacy leads to being open to judgment by others. It leads to being a uh, misinterpretation, uh, potentially, and deprives one of the ability to share discriminately or not share at all. It also leads to self-censorship, which is another way of saying loss of freedom of expression. If you watch it all, uh, all the time, you will change the way you talk and behave. I'm being filmed here. Uh, Oh, I'm so used to that, I forget about it, but <laughs> if, if, if you're not, if, if you're not, a, not used to it, or if you are self-aware, self-conscious of it, you will change, you will try to change your behaviour. So, um, I think it's another side of the same coin as loss of freedom of expression. Uh, some people, and in some circumstances, I would call it social pressure as well, you know, putting someone in a circumstance, an environment where um, being seeing and having to behave in a particular way might be a good thing, but that's another discussion. <clears throat> it is at this level, as in the social level or the individual level, uh, that I would argue that privacy is to identity what free will, or at least an illusion of it, is to morality. Now this is a tricky argument in this, in this company because there are many theories about morality and free will, but let's stick with the... Let's just bear with me. <laughs> Without going into intricacies of moral theory, it is fair to say that without the ability to choose the right or wrong action, morality would not exist, or at least by certain definition. I'm aware of where I'm saying these things. Similarly, without the ability to keep things to oneself, share them with some people and not others, present oneself to the world in one way and not the other, there is no meaningful identity. There's no meaningful self-identity or identity that you create for yourself. Um, perhaps I should preface all these words, all these concepts with the word autonomous, just because there are people who believe that identity is something that is defined for you, but I'm not one of them. Um, I have some useful quotes here because uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, Mark Fesher, a really famous uh, guy within this area. He, he, um, yeah. Anyway, he's famous for coding something very interesting, but he's also uh, a sensible guy who talks about privacy a lot. And in his recent blog post where he explains why he deleted his Facebook account, privacy is the foundation of freedom. Without private space to think, to reflect, and yes, to share, we can have no private action, no individual agency. Privacy is dangerous, but privacy is not criminal. It is necessary for the healthy functioning of a democracy. We should resist anyone who proclaims the death of privacy because they are a proxy for interests who would seek to control us, to corral us by our needs, and or separate us by whom we choose to conspire with. I don't expect many of you will leave today, i.e. Facebook. There's almost nowhere else to go. But a few of you will do the sums and understand, as I do, that no website, no matter how useful, is worth this. We need to start over with some important lessons learned about privacy and the intrinsic value of human connections. I take heart in the fact that every one of the Internet's walled gardens, of which Facebook is merely the latest incarnation, have eventually collapsed. Facebook is having its day, but memento mori. Couldn't have put it better myself. Um, another another um, very sound individual, Bruce Schneier, who is very known for uh, his security teachings. Oh good, people are not even excellent. <laughs> um, he, he wrote a very interesting blog post, brief but very powerful, on value of privacy. Uh, he wrote it in 2006 and uh, it's still top of Google uh, search for Bruce Schneier and privacy. Um, 
If you're doing anything, if you aren't doing anything wrong, what do you have to hide? Some clever answers. I'm not doing anything wrong, then you have no cause to watch me. If I'm not doing anything wrong, then you have no cause to watch me. Because the government gets to define what's wrong and they keep changing the definition. Because you might do something wrong with my information. My problem with quips like these, as right as they are, is that they accept the premise that privacy is about hiding a wrong. It's not. Privacy is an inherent human right and a requirement for maintaining the human condition with dignity and respect. Two proverbs say it best. Quis custodiet custodes ipsos. I probably don't have the right English pronunciation, but who watches the watchers? And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Cardinal Richelieu understood the value of surveillance when he famously said, if one would give me six lines written by the hand of the most honest man, I would find something in them to have in hand. Watch someone long enough and you'll find something to arrest, or just blackmail with. Privacy is important because without it, surveillance information will be abused to peep, to sell to marketers and to spy on political enemies, wherever they happen to be at the time. Right, so privacy is good. I'm sure most of you came here with that view already. Uh, uh, but it doesn't hurt to run through the reasons why this is so. Um, in fact, last week I had a dinner with a friend of mine who is rather known in the field of cryptography. For those who know anything about this, he is credited with coming up with the concept for public key cryptography uh, that made it possible for us to communicate privately online today. I asked him about his views on privacy uh, in sort of preparation for, for this talk and another one I'm giving in France in a month. Um, and his answer surprised me a bit until I realized that his reaction was based on experience with authorities and institutions hiding behind privacy at times when disclosure was needed. His view is that institutions and public figures shouldn't hide behind the veil of privacy. Also, his experience online is rather different to mine. Um, he doesn't generate or share any social data, at least not to my knowledge, and I'm not sure he's fully aware of the explosion of private data online shared by individuals. So I recalibrated my question, and we agreed that privacy is essential to individuals' autonomy. So in that case, I mean, he was on the same page, just his experience of privacy was actually the opposite. It was, was privacy was imposed or used as a shield by institutions when, when uh, transparency was needed. Um, and then, then sort of we, we vehemently agreed. <laughs> Uh, here I think it may be relevant to talk about personal data, and one of the reasons I think it's relevant is because um, uh, Rick Diffie did not, does not live online the same way as most of us do, so him, for him personal data was most definitely uh, addresses and uh, details that institutions might be willing to hide rather than him somehow exposed. So I, in short, I would say in short, personal data ain't what it used to be. Um, we have uh, suddenly sort of two, two and a half categories are emerging, and I'll talk about the first two. Static data, name, address, phone number, uh, date of birth, that's pretty static. Uh, your address may not be, your mobile might not be, your name is even, but they, they, let's call them static for the purpose of this discussion. And they are almost exclusively data that are about you for a system's purpose, for a purpose of, of fitting into some kind of system. The name, yeah, maybe, but that's, you know, a, a, a sort of a, um, a handle on, on your identity within the, the, the society, your address, to the pubs to find you, etc., etc. Um, what they're not is uh, defined by you. They, none, of those, none of those types of personal data are actually something that you can just say, well, I'll tell you what, um, I feel like this week I'm going to call this street something different. Uh, you can just about, you know, put a sign saying, you know, Hobbit's Cottage, if you have a, a, you know, a house somewhere and, you know, if you, you feel that way. That's pretty cool, but that's not exactly uh, dynamic or, or self-driven. The second type of data um, is dynamic. Uh, it's data that's created by you for social or other purpose, also defined by you. And I'm talking about online. I'm talking about stuff that you create by pretty much doing anything online, uh, even just browsing. 
um, that wouldn't be very social data, but that's data that you left behind your digital detritus, your digital dendruff. <laughs> it's basically stuff that um, you may be creating deliberately and stuff that you may be creating without knowledge, without your knowledge. Unfortunately, that data is um, used by others as well, and that's part of the discussion. But it's interesting that for the, I would argue for the first time in history, you can define data that is intensely personal to you, and you can share it and publish it and distribute it in a way that connects you to others. That, that is pretty revolutionary. The value of this personal social data, I, I call it data social because A is the buzzword du jour and also it separates it from the personal data as most people understand it, the name, address and phone number. So social data is the stuff that you create on, in social web or social media. It potentially contains information that's valuable to you and to anyone who might want to influence your behaviour, in short. So how does the internet come into this? <clears throat> and I mean the internet, not the web. Um, the internet is a peer-to-peer -peer network, as I'm sure you all know. Um, whether you think about it or not, that's another matter, but I'm sure you know that it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, it consists, what it means, that it, it, the peer-to-peer -peer thing means that it consists of autonomous nodes that have no center and no intermediaries need necessary for their connection. It is the only non-hierarchical human institution of this size and scale and I would argue possibly the only one at all. Um, in the early days, the evolution of the internet followed this principle, the peerage principle. Let's ignore DNS for the matter of this, for the purposes of this debate, which is hierarchical. IRCs, Usenet, and even personal websites were all based on the existence of interconnected nodes, not of closed platforms. Then, the era of super platforms arrived. We could trace it all the way back to the dot-com era. Uh, or maybe before, AOL. Um, but let's stay with dot-com. E-commerce sites um, amounted to, a closed, to closed places on the web that you visit to do whatever they'd like you to do. Um, before then, there really wasn't one large place you would go. You'd go to different places. You'd, you'd have universities, you know, as nodes. Um, I, I got online actually here. I, I, for some strange reason, was hanging around with the computer science geeks. Um, and in those days, God, I feel so old, we didn't have internet on the roads. I mean, you had to go downstairs to the computer room to, to connect and um, it was fantastic. It was 19, 1993, I got online and I remember the first time, it was, it was seven hours online, solidly. It was just, just too amazing. Um, exploring IRC, used Usenet, and news groups and everything, um, but that was that was all distributed. That was all. There was no no one, no gorilla, no no um, eight hundred pound gorilla out there, um, to my knowledge. There was the backbone, but that's not the same. And Amazon and eBay was born. Google predates them as a search engine, but it didn't start behaving like a platform. Uh, Gmail, Google Docs, Google Calendar, um, etc. Until much later, I think it was 200, 2005 onwards. That's just my dating, might not be correct, but I remember Gmail came out. I think Gmail was, Orkut, uh, Gmail, Orkut and all these things started about 200, 2005. Um, then there was blogging. Um, it started with blogger.com, which wasn't owned by Google then. Uh, movable type, typepad, and blogging was sort of perfected uh, architecturally or, or technologically by WordPress. That's what I think is the um, best platform for blogging today. After, after that, it's platforms all the way. After, the, the, there was the last of the more distributed technologies online. From Friendster to MySpace to Facebook, default for any web service was to build a silo for its users. That's another end though, about silos on the web. But for the purposes of this talk, the fact your, your data resides on someone else's platform it is, is the most important point here. It doesn't matter how trustworthy they may be, 
to you right now, or how wonderful the functionality or convenience they offer is. The truth is, your data is no longer yours. And what you create and build there is, is usable by them and they benefit from it before you do, if at all. That's the point. Try to, try to get your data out of Facebook. Try to analyze it. Try to play with it. Try to do something, anything with it, other than add another application onto the thing. You could, with Facebook Connect, you could probably take some of it and connect it to another website. Yeah, that's, I'll, I'll actually I'm dealing with that next data portability and various other fixes such as uh, Google's Open Social and Facebook Connect um, are not addressing the big black hole in the middle of all this. The user is not an autonomous node and is no longer on the course to become one. There are technological and there's a technological and cultural story behind this. The technological one is the fact that we're building platforms or everybody's building platform. If you want a new functionality, let's say you're a web developer and you have this great idea about what people might want to do. So you want to build an application? Well, you have to build a platform. There is no way you can get that functionality to each of your users. You have to bring them to your place. That is the default. Now, to you it sounds, well, yeah, what's wrong with that? I'm trying to point out what might be wrong with that. So, how to protect your privacy? At the moment, if you want to what Facebook provides, not very much, really. One of the, one of the, um, some of the, the recognition I, I have of, you know, people are not going to delete their Facebook accounts of, or Twitter or anything um, unless there is a viable alternative. Because Facebook does provide convenience, does provide certain functionality that's useful. I really, I recognize that. The fact is, um, it also is the incarnation of what's wrong with that default of your data having to be given up to a third party in order to do anything with it. If you want to do something towards that, I guess, you know, helping projects like Diaspora or the Mind Project, which I will describe, which was introduced briefly, but I will describe that next. Um, well, that's where you can do a lot to help. Um, either someone with the right skills, or as one of the first users who then help to make these tools better for the next lot, who may not be so concerned about the ideology or principles behind them. Um, the problem, the problem with the with the alternatives to Facebook and to all the platforms I'm raving against, um, is that. None of those alternatives will be ready made and will be easily, you know, it will be sort of, oh, well, we'll just switch to that, because that would be just yet another platform. Um, they will be clunky, they will be um, simple, they won't offer the same services as Facebook does. So most people will not see that. The point is to get those people who do, who care about privacy, who want, who already hate Facebook, and are willing to invest time and care and, and a bit of patience to helping those tools, making them better. Uh, the MIME project um, is cleverly called MIME, as in something that's owned as MIME. Um, it is designed to do three things. Um, allow you to reclaim your data wherever it is. And, you know, we do that through either importing the data, so if you want your Flickr photos, you should be able to export them and import them into mine. Uh, if it's Facebook, maybe trying some scrapers, whether the Facebook likes it or not. If it's Amazon, Ditto. Basically, I'm looking at every single platform where you left any data behind and being in some ways able to reclaim it. Um, whether we manage that or not depends on what coders we get to write the scrapers. But um, um, that's the idea. So reclaiming your data and being able to easily and 
richly create new ones. Uh, so mine is supposed to be your repository, your library, your, your, the place where you can go back and revisit the data, display, visualize it, analyze it on your own terms. That's the second thing, manage your data. Um, analysis, pattern recognition, retrieval. And done in ways that are convenient and easy. This is a huge UX UI problem, a challenge, because it has to be simple, sorry, easy. It has to be easy and, and intuitive. That alone is a <laughs> large um, challenge to take on. And then finally, nuanced and granular sharing. There's a lot of talk about social networks. I don't think they're very social at all. If you define social, as ability to have nuanced relationships with people. Uh, instead of saying friend or not friend, what kind of nuance is that? That's a very binary choice. <laughs> exactly, and you're still on your Facebook, right? I know. Um, that's not social. That's actually, um, and I do respect developers, but that's a, that's a software engineer's idea of social. That, that's, that's a setting. That's not a, that's not a social expression. So what if you could find other ways of being social? You, you, you go to a party, you talk to people in different ways to each one of them. Uh, privacy. This is, this is the most important thing for me when I think about privacy online. And in, sorry, in social web, where you're part of all these networks and you're communicating with people. Privacy is not a setting. Privacy is a behavioral policy. It sounds pretty conceptual, but all it means is when you talk to people, you talk to each person differently. If you have a friend who betrays confidences, you're not going to tell him the same as you tell a friend who never does and is is always discreet. That privacy policy is in your head and is applied as and when you're interacting with people. You don't need a tick box. Oh, I'm going to talk to so and so, I'm going to talk to James, I'm now going to, you know, tick this box and I'm not going to discuss this with you. And I'm prior to that. that is not human, that's not how we work. And yet, that is what Facebook and all the other social networks are clumsily trying to do. So, what we thought of doing um, is, is offering some more, some other way, more granular or more nuanced of sharing stuff with people. And it's not done on settings that are not, re not relevant to the content, I mean directed to the content. So, without getting too technical, uh, do you know about tagging? Anybody knows about tagging? Yes, good. Um, so we decided that we use tags because they are most um, user-driven taxonomy, it's a user-defined taxonomy. Um, and so if I, for example, um, I use this example exhaustively because I'm, I'm into wine and it's easy uh, use case. Um, at dinner we had a bottle of wine and I found it very good, so I'll take a picture of it. My mobile phone wasn't that good, but it was good enough. So I, took, I would take a picture of it if it was something I wanted to remember. And I upload it to mine and I tag it. I tag it red wine, I tag it um, Oxford, I tag it uh, shopping if I want to look it up. And I don't know, I tag it um, Oxford Libertarian Society, I tag it decent, or cheap, deal, whatever tags I want. And there it goes into my mind. Those tags are hooks on that information for my retrieval later. For sharing, what, there's the other side to that. Um, if I discover that one of you guys are also fond of wine and we have some sort of tendencies to distinct differentiating between good and bad wine, uh, I might create a feed for you. Anybody knows feeds? RSS feeds? Yep, yeah, good, excellent. This is easy. Um, I might decide. I, I might be. I will be able to create a feed for you only, one feed per person that will be created on the basis of tags that I decide to use for creation of that feed. So, to you it will be libertarianism, um, wine, study, <laughs> PPE, whatever. I decide what they are and I create, I generate a feed that is just for you. You take that feed, that URL, key, 
whatever it is, that is only private to you, and you subscribe to it. So whenever I next go and create an object that will be tagged red wine or Sicilian wine, you will get that object in your feed. You will not get anything else but the objects that are tagged, the same tags that the feed was created with. And that's much more granular and that happens to be something that you're doing as you go along. Um, yeah, I got technical, <laughs> but that was just to try to say it's not perfect. It's still a technological solution to a social problem, but it is a done lot better than a setting that just says, okay, he's a friend, so you get to see everything. There's no granularity to that. Or your friend in the group, I don't even, frankly, I, yeah, privacy, Facebook privacy settings are a whole uh, other area of research. <laughs> so, um, that's the kind of approach I have to privacy. That's how I understand. How I came up, how I sort of started thinking about privacy this way, I, I hang around a lot of security geeks for some reason. Um, perfectly good people. Um, very interesting observations. One of them was that security is not a setting. Security is a policy. That sounds a really strange thing to say, but then one of the examples which I find very powerful is um, if you connect um, and they insist a PC machine to internet un unprotected in order to study how fast it gets destroyed by viruses, isn't that, that is not insecure. That computer is not insecure. That's what you want to do with that. In other contexts, that would be a very insecure, uh, as in lacking security, computer. So, that's the same with privacy. And if, if you have a third party determining how your data is private and secure, you're never going to be autonomous. It's, never, you, it's not privacy anymore. That data is not pretty private. So, the argument is that unless, until we have our data in the hands of intermediaries and third parties, that data cannot be truly private. That's the disaster we're heading for, because the default is to create third parties and intermediaries. And um, the slightly good news is that there are people who don't like that. And I think there is a zeitgeist um, starting to bubble to the surface, whether that makes any difference or not in, in the short or medium run, I don't know, but the Diaspora project, <coughs> bless you, that is last two months, I think, they raised $200,000 of pounds and to build a distributed social network. Um, I think that's a tremendous idea. They seem like uh, guys who have some understanding and some substance. Uh, the inspiration, I believe, came from the same talk I really enjoyed and recommend. I, um, I, I, I will give the details. It's uh, Evan Moglen about freedom in the cloud. He's a professor of uh, law at Columbia University and also known um, uh, for his role in the Freedom Soft Free Software Foundation. He's, uh, that talk was phenomenal. That actually expressed everything I've been fighting for for the last three, four years. And uh, I highly recommend that. It's easy to find, if you haven't already heard about it. And I think the guys from Diaspora were at that talk in February, and that was the result uh, of the talk where the professor called and said, you technologists, you fix this. And the, the talk describes in much more technical details why we're heading for a disaster. I was trying to give a sort of more my, my um, uh, perspective. Okay, so any questions? Can you explain a bit about the about a piece, um, a bit about security in PCs and seeing how long it should Oh yes, I okay. Yeah, I can, I can do that because it's not mine. <laughs> As in, I don't have to defend it, I just have to describe it. Um, if the purpose of you exposing the PC to open internet, mm -hmm. as in unprotected internet or firewall, is to discover just how quickly and how it gets destroyed by viruses. Mm -hmm. You cannot call that computer 
uh, insecure, unsecured, because that's what you're doing with it. That's the whole point. So, so security is a is a function of what of of the purpose of the intention okay. of the user. I think that's the term. Okay. And 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 if you describe security as a policy, you'd be much closer to the truth than describing security as, as a preset default or, or setting. I think that is a very important school of thought in security. It's not the prevailing one in the normal world, uh, especially where systems are concerned. Mm -hmm. But the security geeks that I know are very much favoring that. The, and I think it's much more conducive to user autonomy as well. Because if you, as a security person or a security geek, acknowledge that security is dependent on the user's intention, then you have to design the systems in a very different way. And I think that's a good thing. Welcome back. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, yeah, Does that, yeah. Yeah? There, there are a couple of names I can give you, people who've written about this, I think. One is, th this particular example was by Alec Muffet, M-U-F-F-E-T, who is a quite a well-known security geek. And, um, oh, I call them security geeks. What else can you give them? What else? Security experts, they sound like, you know, people who transport currency. Um, um, yeah, no, security geek sounds good. <laughs> So he, he, he's a um, he's big proponent of that kind of approach. And another one is Ben Laurie, who also talks about capabilities. And they, they, they all are looking deeply into how the computers and systems are designed. And they're not the mainstream by far. They, they're famous, but they're not, mm -hmm. their, their views of security are not mainstream, sadly. Yeah. Um, so if I put um, information into Facebook, which yeah. is... Um, well, I suppose uh, untrue. It's fictional. Yeah, um, ah, yes. So, to what extent have I protected my privacy? Uh, have I done anything towards that or not at all? I, I refer to the honourable gentleman to my distinction between private and social data. <laughs> <laughs> um, the private, the personal data you may have fudged. So what? Mm -hmm. That data's purpose is any in any way, is it, in any case, is just to to put you somewhere in the system. You know, people. Obviously, people who want to do you harm um, will appreciate knowing your date of birth and address or whatever if, if in the traditional mm -hmm. physical world. But online, what's far more interesting and useful to people who might want to do you harm by, by that definition is everything else about you. And that's in the stream of social data. So if you are to use Facebook for any benefit to yourself at all, you are going to be disclosing things about you that are private, that, that are personal. Just by connecting with others, just by subscribing to groups, by using applications, by doing anything at all, you are already generating a set of data that is personal in the second sense of the word, uh, in the second category, which is the social data. Which means, so, so, okay, think of all the stuff that's in your Facebook, was it news stream? Yes, yeah, on the... On the yeah. Yeah. That there's tons of stuff about you. Okay. I don't need to know your name and name and address. I can find out that anyway. What, what would you do with this sort of disembodied information, though, I suppose? Assuming it would be difficult. It's actually very bodied. It's actually the main body of data that is useful to people uh, you want to protect it from. Um, from advertisers to marketers mm. um, to... Well, I don't think they are that evil anthropologists <laughs> <laughs> who are looking for aggregate data. Okay, Adrian, have, have you heard about the AOL releasing search history uh, anonymized? Mm -hmm. It took people not very long at all to find out exactly who those people were. And these were anonymized. Okay, that's probably, yeah, I rest, I rest my case. With sufficient amount of data and, and, and sufficiently clever analysis, you can find out pretty much everything. There's some very spooky experiments that, you know, you take someone who thinks, oh, well, I'll just do a little bit of that and there's someone to return that. They can find out stuff about them that they would be horrified to 
nerds to see that people know. Just like a jigsaw, you piece it together. That's not that hard. If you actually do a proper Google search on someone, you can do that yourself if you want. It's quite amazing. Human mind is very good at putting things together. Imagine if you have human mind with a lot of technology and experience and a bad purpose. <laughs> so, you know, anonymizing or pseudonymizing mm -hmm. the personal data, the static personal data. Sorry, not good enough. Doesn't really make much difference. I see. It may stop junk mail, but frankly, they, that's not really that interesting. Okay, I give you an example. Um, Behavioral targeting, anyone knows what that is? Okay. Uh, I find it creepy, I hate that. I think behavioral targeting is invasion of privacy. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, so, that's all they need. They don't need to know your but name. I, 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 I suppose in this case, for example, say, so the uh, advertising mm -hmm. and all these sort of techniques are gonna come, they come via Facebook. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not gonna come via I mean, what I'd be worried about is if they could find a way of accessing me in ways that I haven't already disclosed as being, like, I mean, I, you know, I kind of accept, I suppose, in a sense, Facebook as a bit like entering into, I suppose, some sort of somewhat kind of overseen marketplace. Like, there's, sort of, there's a group of people who are deciding what rules are going on in there. Yeah. So it's a bit like wandering into, say, a superstore, where you're going to have some stuff shouted at you, um, yeah. you know, um, like about yes, deals but... and whatnot. And, and to an extent, I kind of, I, I suppose, what I think of, of as, as long as, well, okay, so the, the data that I use is not useful outside that environment because they know, okay, I'm, I'm a single entity. When I enter Facebook, I have one identity, no matter what I've called myself and what my age is or yes. whatever. Um, and, I, and I'm wandering around and I'm, I'm interacting with things. So long as those things don't sort of somehow end up elsewhere. So, you know, the, the people aren't knocking at my door or ringing my phone, which is when things start to get irritating. Um, I'm not so bothered if if someone happens to be targeting some you know, a a advertisements at me, I'm not necessarily that concerned. I mean, if they're, if they're not very well targeted at me, then, I'm, then I find it funny. If they are well targeted at me, I suppose it could be a bit creepy. But if I find it that creepy, I don't have to, I don't have to Absolutely. go into Facebook um, still. No, 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 I understand. The thing is that Facebook is up in the game, and there are ways your data can end up being outside Facebook. Uh, one of them is what caused the latest storm about Facebook and where, you know, uh, going back on the privacy settings and all that. Um, if you like something, the, the couple of applications or sites that if you don't opt out, mm -hmm. they will actually be, yes, you probably know more detail. I, I just don't feel qualified to, to, to describe, but basically, that data, your data is being shared with a set of websites that are outside Facebook. And in a way, it is in line with Facebook's declared objective, which is to become like a web. They, they want to be the web for some people. So this is, a, I guess, first tentative, um, you know, reaching out beyond the Facebook. The second way is Facebook Connect. But I think that you'd have to do something, you might, and that data might end up connected to other websites or appearing on websites. So if you have your own website and you want your Facebook stream to appear on another website, you use Facebook Connect hmm. or somebody else's website. Um, so, you know, fine. You, you, still, you still can... Th this is the thing, that you can... You can go through all the privacy settings. I mean, I, I had my Facebook account and I hardly, I actually don't use Facebook. I used it for connecting Twitter to it and uh, LinkedIn and stuff. And for those people who are just on Facebook, it was just another channel to my other properties, online properties, that I, I hardly ever logged on to Facebook. You know, some, some poor um, Facebook user commented there and there on Facebook. I had to go and see that. That even that got me into trouble. I deactivated my account about a week ago, two weeks ago, because it, there was there some worm or something going on. It just wasn't worth it. I got hijacked and sent spam to my friends. I can't be bothered. I probably will delete my account anyway. I mean, I had to be on it to see what why I hate it, right? But um, it's, it's not longer, longer worth it. But the point is, you, you know, 
a lot of privacy uh, concerned people have a surprisingly narrow view of of how rich the information is out there and how much that can be mined. I bet you anything, I, mean, I consider myself a very private person even though I live online and I'm absolutely certain that if someone took, you know, took the task upon themselves they could find everything about me. They could just piece it together from over the years of, you know, putting it together. They could probably present a little profile, a little report that I would go, oh my god, I had you know, this is scary. I don't want necessarily the world to see it that way. And that's that's the point. Because there is a there's increasingly this is a another very different topic which is all connected but it's a huge area in itself. Um, there's increasing functionality um, that helps people analyze the data and not just not uh, institutions, um, companies and individuals too, and data analysis is becoming more commonplace, the tools and the functionality is becoming easier to acquire. So uh, to the point where I'm arguing for being able to do my own data analysis in ways that currently only very sophisticated systems can. Um, that's uh, an area called personal informatics and I call it self-analytics. That's, that's a fascinating area. So together with that, you know, your, your privacy stands no chance. Um, the way, I don't want to get rid of sharing. I think sharing is wonderful. And I think sharing, sorry, second stage of sharing is sharing with discrimination. That's what I'm aiming for. Rather than saying, oh, this is all too much, I'm going to go home. That, as I said at the start, I don't think um, binary choices are choices at all. Um, a lot of, again, a lot of privacy concerned people, privacy freaks, argue, well, you shouldn't then play. If you don't like terms and conditions, you just you just don't use it. I don't think that's a viable um, protection. That's just, that's an abstention. As a song. That's not really, um, doesn't empower you in any way. Um, so, I think the way I would, I'm trying to deal with that is I want to own my data. I still want to share it, but I want to share it on my own terms. That's really what it comes down to. If my contacts I share my data with betray my confidence, well, that's just like in the real world. I'll have to deal with that. It's more complicated in the real world because it's all, you know, copied and online a lot, but, you know, it's the same thing. I trust you and I tell you something and then you put it online or distribute it it's between you and me rather than between me, Facebook and millions of others. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. So, okay. So it's a sort of argument in the wilderness right now. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh no, we are yes. Help. Oh, yes. Um, I'm only interested in privacy, but uh, I think uh, uh, any new technology will bring some new risk for uh, to privacy. Do you think so? Um, mm -hmm. Before uh, we have email email yeah. address and uh, um, we can communicate very conveniently. But uh, <coughs> some people think uh, email can can be in uh, can be used by some other people such as. Uh, Yes, I'm trying, trying to. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. I got, I got the first bit, but the question. Yeah. Um, the question is, uh, <laughs> uh, any new technology can bring new uh, risk uh -huh. to privacy. So I think protect privacy is very difficult. In this morning, I see um, a paper um, said uh, in American. A uh, computer scientist uh, invited a chip, a oh, processor yeah. in his body to infect uh, computer virus. And they want to know if the chips can um, infected by computer virus and uh, what will happen. Mm. You, mean, uh, so, you mean RFID chips or even more sophisticated yeah, ones? Yeah, okay. So, now that's, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's an ongoing, that's a big privacy debate. I mean, 
sure I have opinions about that, but <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think with RFID, it's I, I slightly touched upon that. It's the convenience of it, right? And it's uh, in Spain apparently, uh, if you go to a nightclub, they give you they they sort of uh, offer you at the entrance. Not and I know from my own experience, I've been told this. They sort of offer to implant, I think it's somewhere here, a little yes. RFID chip. Uh, so you don't have to use your credit card. And you can pay just by then being swiped on your arm and you carry on partying and clubbing. And uh, that obviously um, applies for other things. It's not just for the club, but that's when they get them. Yeah. Because it's, so they find scenarios where the convenience is really um, high. And that's how they, uh, I, yeah, I think that's pretty awful. Um, Fantastic. There is, okay, that kind of brings me to, I think, kind of fundamental point that um, the best, the best defense against these things, or the best countermeasure, uh, from my point of view, is to increase the autonomy of the individual as much as possible. So I, I'm not. I, I don't feel. I don't know how I would fight against RFID. Maybe you know some activism and some stuff. But but ultimately, where I chose to fight was on. Well, it's not fight. It's to create and build tools that will help me balance that out. So that will either give me ability to counter it, or will create a situation where people are so used to being autonomous in other areas that those kind of encroachment on privacy will be unacceptable. One of the things that I saw, I see, uh, have seen happening um, with um, younger generation, and I'm not sure it's going to last, is that they're so used to being able to do certain things that when they go to an environment that doesn't let them do that, it's just unacceptable. Whereas previous generation would just consider that, well, that's the way it is. So, I don't have a way of fighting things like RFID chips other than joining some organization that argues on civil, uh, civil liberties and privacy basis. Uh, what I chose to do instead, because that's a long, long haul and very frustrating thing to do, um, I chose to go and try to build something online which I consider much more dynamic and free space to build tools that basically make people uh, not accept those things. I don't know whether that's going to happen, and in fact, I'm here to say, well, it's kind of all heading to a disaster. But there is still hope, as long as we can build those tools, as long as there are people who understand and care about that. Internet is the best way to distribute that gradually, and then change that, for, at least for individuals. Mm -hmm. I know some countries have uh, data protection policy or laws such as BS, um, oh sorry, um, <laughs> okay. data, data Protection Act um, oh, 1998 yeah. in UK and they also put up a um, um, BS in 2012, yeah. but why they haven't uh, put policy to protect the privacy? Well, I, I think by the time we have to rely on law and regulation, it's all lost anyway. If you have to, if, and it's actually getting to that point, if all our data is with third parties and intermediaries, uh, yeah, we still have, you know, Data Protection Act, we still have, I don't think that's enough. I mean, it's better than nothing, I guess, but it's, that's not, that's not enough. That's not a way to, to solve the issue. But yeah, then, yeah, that's all very relevant points, and then we start. <laughs> How interested do you think most people are in that? How, int How interested do you think most people are in analysing their own data? Not at all. People are not interested in data. But um, I think everybody is interested in some aspect of their lives. Of their life, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm interested in wine, uh, travel, restaurants, and lots of other things I'm not prepared to mention. <laughs> but. Um, Everybody's interested in something. Unfortunately, in general terms, I have to call it data, which is extremely boring. But I bet you anything, you know, put in front of me a person, anyone, they will, they will find something they're interested in and something where having record or uh, ability to go back or just, just 
outsource your memory and, and, and look at your behavioral pattern, um, patterns. Uh, I mean, okay, I give you, uh, there's, there's this whole area of personal informatics is really worth looking into because I think, I think it's like a new kind of literacy. Uh, it's, it's ability to understand something about yourself or the ability to analyze data and again, very boring, um, in an area that you're interested in. It's like being able to read a book about something you're interested in. It opens up a whole new uh, potential of, of human knowledge. And you know, 300 years if you ask a peasant, you know, um, why don't you, you want to write, read and write? And I said, no, why, should, why do I need that? I just go to the priest or teach in the village and they'll do that for me, <laughs> right? How do you explain to that person that it's not about reading and writing? It's not about the data analysis. It's about what that knowledge and understanding gives you. So, yeah, the answer to your question, people are not interested. But if there are tools and ways of doing that that is relevant to them and to their interests, hell yes. <laughs> And it's not, you know, I just need to find a way of not describing this data analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost giving people the opportunity to see how the world mm -hmm. sees them yeah. based on their yeah. behavioral patterns and yeah. interests. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's okay, uh, stupid thing like dieting. I don't know, I don't think you have time watching stupid TV, neither do I, but occasionally it happens. Mm -hmm. There are these uh, programs about, you know, if somebody has really bad eating habit, like they, all they eat is chocolate or crisps or whatever. The first thing they do, and there's some, you know, TV psychologies to sort of, you know, going to turn them and make their lives better. The first thing they do is to bring them to a room where they show them all they eat in a week or a month or something, and the person is horrified. Human mind is so full of cognitive biases. We don't remember stuff. We don't know anything about. I mean, we, we fool ourselves. Our memory is so unreliable when it comes to ourselves. Uh, or how much chocolate we eat, or how much we drink. I mean, even on that very primitive, simple level. Uh, what about your sleeping patterns? What about your exercise? What about your, you know, chronic disease management? Um, these are the most obvious areas where this is being developed. But that can be applied to anything. Well, why can't I be able to analyze and visualize and manipulate data about pretty much anything in my life? I won't do it for all my life, but I will do it for areas that matter to me and will improve my self-awareness and change, self-awareness is the beginning of change of behavior and that you're changing the behavior on your own terms because you want to and, and if I were to use the fear argument, if you don't do that, somebody else will. Data analysis and pattern recognition uh, that help other people, including yourself, to change your behavior is a double-edged sword. So you might just as well hold that.